activity at the most appropriate time, the endocrine disruptors. Um, and so we know, as far as the process is concerned, uh, the endocrine, uh, there, there's been discussions at the October 2017 meeting on the first proposal, um, uh, the commission proposal. In December 2017, there was also a uh, standing committee meeting with a, with a qualified majority support um, for, the, for the revised commission proposal. And in January 2018, there was a proposal that was sent to the European Parliament um, and to the Council for scrutiny um, with a deadline until April 2018. And there were no objections um, received from the European Parliament or Council. Uh, so in November 2018, the criteria are expected to be formally applied. Um, the final criteria are applied to new active substances uh, or renewals that are submitted after the application date of the final criteria, which will be around November 2018, uh, now, which is now. New active substances or renewals where um, approval vote has not yet taken place at the criteria uh, the, at the time the criteria apply for, and then active substances with requirements that are related to providing confirmatory data related to endocrine properties. Um, the interim criteria is in force uh, until those ones are officially applied. And then I just wanted to highlight again for flagging, pesticides that were identified as potential EDs or endocrine disruptors based on uh, the Commission Impact Assessment Report that uh, relevant to certain commodities in option two and three, um, two, four D, it doesn't mean it's, doesn't mean they're out. They were, there are chemicals on here that are potentially have criteria, but it doesn't mean they're out, okay? Um, then boscolid, cypermethrin, the other one is phenamidone that we use, uh, epidion, which is obviously we've lost that anyway, and that was one of the issues that, that was considered. Uh, malathion, also here, but I will touch on malathion because malathion has actually reached the stage where its conditions of approval had changed for greenhouse use only in the EU. Um, yeah, malathion, the capsaicin, malathion, yeah. Um, and then Mancozeb, Maneb, and Metiram, which are all dithiocarbamates. I wanted to actually say to you, because, sorry, uh, Mancozeb is one of the ones that worries us because of the many chemicals. This is where if, if chemistries are combined, I don't know if that happens in Peru, but we have quite a few chemicals where Mancozeb is with another active. So it will affect many of our, our trade names then. But I have in front of me um, a document that, that was received by one of the companies where it actually indicates that having done an as initial ass assessment um, that Mancozeb is not going to be problematic for the endocrine disruptors. And they've actually at the moment extended um, the uh, authorization, but it appears it's not one of those that's going to be too critical. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. There we go. Sorry. Okay, so we already know that Thyram has uh, one of the... I took the slide out of my thing this morning, but that's definitely also got to the non-approval state. Um, so when they were doing the authorization, they were obviously already applying some of these things. So those chemicals there are, so I see one of them, spiridoxism, one of your products, uh, and tebuconazole. So it's just a space to watch. I'm not saying they're going out, but they definitely obviously have certain endocrine disrupting concerns. Oh, sorry, were you looking at that? So it's potential ED criteria.
Okay, so the future timeline, March, well, th th this was earlier. So July 2018, there was a second discussion and there are a number of critical concerns, a percentage of substances regarded as uh, endocrine disruptor properties likely to be much higher than estimated in the commission impact assessment. So there are approximately 26 substances in the group 1A and 8% of substances on the market. So that's just an indicator. We don't know what. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide because I've already <laughs> talked through it, but um, we all know the process. Perchlorate, okay, also one of those that we've been tracking. Um, the European Commission adopted an updated statement on the presence of perchlorate in food on the 23rd of uh, June 2015. Um, as these e levels are the reference levels or indicative interim levels, the Commission requested member states to monitor the presence of perchlorate in various food products, so they were doing monitoring. EFSA published an opinion for setting permanent levels at the end of September 2017 and identified exposure above EFSA's guidance values or reference values uh, to what, the, what they call the intra-EU uh, levels. So far, there's no detailed discussion with the EU member states. The levels that have been proposed by the European Commission to member states for discussion will be based on the EFSA reasoned opinion, RO is the reasoned opinion, and collected occurrence data that they've got. And Fresh will, um, will have the op opportunity to comment on the Commission proposal before and after the summer during the stakeholder consultation. And no vote is expected until the end of 2018. And I just added in this slide because in the most one of the more recent fresh file newsletters they have indicated that uh, there is a, per, uh, a, a European Commission stakeholder consultation on the maximum levels and if you look there it's not yet been applied but if you look at fruits and vegetables um, it is at 0 0.05 <coughs> with the exception of some of the leafy greens so that's the indicated level. I'm not gonna say too much about this, except that uh, in roughly December, because I know I ended up doing it twice, on Old Year's Eve, because it kicked me out and it was a very, very long stakeholder consultation, which um, everyone, it was an open consultation and the EU put it out there, they wanted to um, get the view of stakeholders on the regulation 1107 and 396. So um, they called it the refit evaluation. It was an online survey. Um, Freshfell completed it, I completed it, um, and there were also some case studies that, uh, that they included in theirs. Uh, there was also a workshop on this, uh, and uh, there were some outcomes that came from the workshop in May, in May 2018, Freshwell did attend it. Um, this was my, you can see this was the confirmation I got that after the second time it finally got through. I nearly gave up, but I thought I better say my say, and this I did on behalf of Hortgrow and Sati um, to at least make our voice known. And this here, I won't go into detail, but one of the things I highlighted, this was a, a section to make additional comments, and I said while the, the plant protection regulation, plant protection project regulation relates to EU authorization and use of actives, which should not impact on third country use, parties within the EU often complicate the issue by imposing related requirements on non-EU trading partners, having a negative impact on international trade and furthermore, non-regulatory private standards, the PPP MRL requirements imposed by parties within the EU additionally erode and undermine the official EU uh, MRL stuff. So I certainly made my voice known that we don't agree with some of these issues and that was obviously an opportunity. Those of you who are interested, they've now published a study supporting this refit evaluation. Um, I can make it available to you if you want, but it'll probably talk around some of the issues I've talked to today and on some of the, the in inputs that came from various stakeholders. I think the EU feels that, that both these pieces of legislation are doing the right thing and what they want to do, so I can't see it changing, 
but they are looking at some of the outcomes. Then just some very, um, while we're talking about active substances, the AIs, they're, they're one or two newest issues that have been on the discussion. This is one of them, the transitional measures for MRLs for uh, imported fruit and veg. Um, they, they're talking about changing the transitional period and they're also talking about saying that, um, that they're considering whether import tolerances should be allowed to be issued in cases where products have been withdrawn um, that are higher than the EU allowed levels. So there is a discussion going on that. The transitional level, let me just explain, is not, I explained to you earlier that if an MRL is going down six months after the publication of that regulation, then it only enters into force. This still leaves that you have the six months entry into force unless it was considered to be highly um, risky. This, is, this goes beyond it. And then this was also just a list of the candidates for substitution that was issued in 2015, which is just another resource to say which actives um, might be on there. But remember what I said, if it's a candidate for substitution, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a blacklist. And in fact, if something's a candidate for substitution, there are one or two cases, lambda cyhalothrin is one of them, where they can be reauthorized, but not as long as 10 years, it's a, a seven year uh, for candidates of substitution. And if they've got enough data to fill the data gaps, it can actually come off the candidates for substitution list. But it, it is nonetheless one of the criteria that gets considered in the hazard. No, uh, um, there is a, there was a, a, the one of the latest fresh file documents that indicated there is a discussion going on for copper. They're not going to, it, it's, it's about the renewal because it's coming up for reauthorization. It's not a case of not being reauthorized. It does sound to me like they may reduce the level slightly, but it's to do with the environmental protection. Right now. So I did see that they, they were going to discuss it at one of the upcoming uh, meetings, but they postponed the vote, the discussion on it. Then this is another issue, the ARFD. Yeah, maybe then it's a close logo. Uh, okay. On the, on the mic. On the mic. It's on? better okay um, okay so um, I won't go into the detail of it but um, the ARFD is one of the issues if that is still causing some issues in the sense that there are certain products like ethapon like chlorpyrifos where the ARFD level exceeds the MRL and in this case, it poses, like for us, even though the MRL for Ethapon is one, the certain retailers won't allow us to use it at one because it's exceeding the ARFD. Um, so it definitely is, is an issue. Um, and the one problem that... Um, Freshville has identified that they've tried to discuss, there was a position paper that went to the commission, is that when a EFSA reasoned opinion is published, that does not mean it's yet being applied. It's a document that the risk assessor puts together and then it goes for discussion. But one of the problems um, is that parties, and I'm going to that slide, private parties will start, in some cases, implementing the EFSA opinions before it's adopted. So we had that case with, with Ethapon before it was actually adopted. 
they were putting pressure that we can't use it. Um, so even with the indoxicarb, it's one of the actives we use. Um, there was an EFSA opinion to change the ARFD for indoxicarb. Um, and they started trying to apply it, and yet the MRL has not been changed yet. So it has been flagged. It's the same thing that happened with chlorpyrifos in 2016. Um, so certain parties applying the so-called uh, ARFD level from the reasoned opinion before it's actually been voted on or accepted as an issue. Okay, so this is the point that I've been making all along, the cutoff criteria for plant protection products, substances that are carcinogenic, mutagenic, have reprotoxic uh, repro substances or ED properties to farmers, bystanders or consumers. Um, this, is a, this is an area that uh, is being well monitored by Freshfell through the WTO process. Um, and the, the point I was making earlier, there's a discussion which is ongoing whether import tolerances should be allowed <coughs> for products that fall under the cutoff criteria. And the European Commission's legal interpretation is that it should not be allowed, according to 1107 and 396. But the RMS, which is the Rapporteur Member States, position is that they don't want to refuse parties requests for import tolerances if they apply. Um, so it's still under discussion among the European uh, parties. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that might st still get attention. At the moment, you're still allowed to apply for an import tolerance, even if it's reached cutoff criteria has had an impact, but it might change for the future. I said to you that there was one additional step that we did, we have done because of the DPA. Um, we were concerned that because of the MRL dropping to 0 0.05 from May next year, even if our industry is not using it, because the threshold is so low, if you get the, the margin of error is so low. If you get lab testing, laboratory testing, that is not accurate, they might have what's called, a, it would be an exceedance for not even using it. It's a contamination issue. So we invested um, and we did a, a, a full um, proficiency test through NAMISA, which is one of the parties in South Africa that does ring testing. We included two international labs that we, we knew performed very well on DPA. I and mean, the, the three or four labs in South Africa that are used commercially were all involved. They were not aware what they were testing. And we've just received the report now. I haven't even evaluated it. We're having a meeting next week to evaluate the outcome and see if there are any steps that need to be taken between our laboratories to ensure that we don't have risk of exceedances if they're not performing well. So that was the final step of risk management, we feel. We know the MRL is going down, but at least we can try and ensure that the lab testing is accurate. Okay, so that's the back on the discussion on the most of the actives. But I said that I would try and give an indication. This is the EU MRL database. And actually there's a lot of information on the database. This is the front page of the database. And you can see that under the two headings, um, you can see uh, the latest active um, substances um, discussion on those that are not going to be approved and the latest MRL. And on the ones that have been published, you can actually get the published regulations on the website. So it's accessible. 
um, it's a bit small to see here, but if you go through here, you will be able to see various ones that I've discussed today with the date it was published. And all I do to get into the EU website is I Google MRL, EU MRL database. And I come into the front page. So this is just to show you that's going down. There's a lot more there. You can see there are a lot of regulations that you can actually go look and see what is it MRL going to be dropping to or going up in some cases. This is the drop down on the website. So this one here is the one to do with malathion. I mentioned that malathion's conditions for approval have been changed for greenhouse use only in the EU. And here at the bottom are the documents which you can get in Spanish. I can get in English, you can get in Spanish. So ES would be for you and EN would be for me. And the PDF version is the one that I always go for. So there is information that you can get and be checking. Um, and this is the same database. Um, it's a little bit small because of my tiredness. But you can see the MRLs again. There's two sections here is in the green side. You can see you can either search for active ingredient or you can search per product and you can get the information. So these are just, just different levels of information. And why I show you this one is you will remember I said to you that with the list of pro Pro Citrus. Um, by going in here, you can actually sort. I'll be honest with you, I asked my assistant to help me. She likes to work with Excel. I hate Excel. <laughs> so she, she did a search on this. And this here is the list of Pro Citrus products. And if you look at this full list, you can see different columns, the substance. You can see when it was approved. You can see the expiry date of the <laughs> approval. And there are quite a few that are coming up for reapproval in 2019. <coughs> um, you, you can see if it's a candidate for substitution. And in, in some cases it says two persistent so the PBT, the persistent products. You can see uh, if it's uh, raised, uh, the information on the um, ARFD. But if you look at the full list, out of all the pro citrus, product, so pro citrus products so far, the red are the ones that are not authorized. So now, fenbutazine oxide, So you see, you can actually search and get information on the website. And while we've been talking mainly chemicals, I just want to touch on the plant health. Because the EU has been changing its plant health legislation, which is fully implemented from December 2019. But they have been developing implementing regulations, or directives, as they call it. The first one was rev the ac uh, the, uh, under 2900, another plant health legislation, um, annexes one to five. They looked at the first group of what they call harmful pests. And for us in South Africa, or for citrus, prunus, persica, which is peaches, nectarines, capsicum, 
Punica granatum, which is pomegranates. Because of the false codling moth which we have, which is Thanatica leucotrica, from the 1st of January 2018, we had to implement requirements, cold treatment, or, and for, for false codling moth, it's a 22-day cold treatment, which you can't do for peaches and nectarines. So we had to work on a full systems approach in order for us to export to the EU. Now, for us, for, for peaches nectarines, we don't have access to any other country. The EU is the country we export to. So the plant health reg regulations are those that you have to start watching because it can affect you. And why I'm warning you is when we first started watching that space for false codling moss, we had no chemicals registered. Not one. And through our crop protection advisory group, we went through a process of identifying what would be the most critical need registrations. And because we have the relationship with the registrar and with the agrochemical companies, we eventually put forward a letter in 20, uh, September 2016 where we uh, requested fast tracking of critical chemicals because of the phytosanitary pest that was coming our way. So we, we looked at, this is just a breakdown of the process. We looked at the type of products that were registered for citrus maybe, which may, we didn't have. We looked at the, the, the actual IPM process when we would need what products. And we put the, the, this out to all the agrochemical industries and we had an excellent response. So much so that when we had to implement our full system from the 1st of January 2018, we actually, we implemented it for the start of our 2017 season in October and we had a full toolbox of the mating disruption all the chemicals. The only one that we didn't have was methoxyphenicide, and we got that one in January. But what I'm trying to highlight is if you don't have the tools and you're exporting, it can have a major impact on your market access. So you must start planning ahead. We actually put in a systems approach. That's the first document. And this is a full guideline document with all the tools, but this is the one I'm, I'm flagging because in my jet lag state the other night, I saw this draft regulation coming through because the EU has been working on a second batch of harmful organisms that are going to require the same sort of steps as we've just had for false codling moss. And why this one worries me is it's for non tefritted fruit flies, uh, uh, non European tefritted, which is fruit flies. And this is for fruits, citrus, again prunus, and mangifera, mango. So I'm I'm just warning you because you you may have in Chile, you might may have in Peru fruit flies that fall into this category. So I've been watching the Eurofight interception data and I've seen they've been focusing on fruit flies. So this is just a warning. And the only I only see I think on your list I think I see malathion. I don't see things like spinosad. There's, there's a combination of spinosad and, uh, and amino acid that is used for fruit flies. Anyway, so we, we also are worried about in some areas, we have Bactacera dorsalis, not in all areas. Western Cape is free of. But we had a problem with the, we had a quarantine uh, area, which, which was found in one area, and we had a problem with exports to the US after that. So 
This is just one to watch. Okay, so that's the discussion on the EU side. But you asked me to just give something on the China, Korea, and Japan. And so I just wanted to give you some resources that we use to get MRL information. The problem is, this, this was notified by the WTO, but you can see, even though it says the chemical, you can't see what the products are. So I'm now going to teach you another thing that you can Google. Because the US puts out what they call gain reports. This is an example of the gain report that came out. Um, and if, you, if I read this for you, it says, on December 18th, 2016, the Chinese National Health and Family Planning Commission, Ministry of Agriculture, China Food and Drug Administration released the National Food Safety Standard, maximum residue limits for pesticides in foods, GB2763216. The standard will replace the current MRL standard, and it quotes the number, and will be implemented on June 18, 2017. This report provides an unofficial translation of the standard. So we are also making use of this translation for our MRL information, because we can't use the one in Chinese. So if you Google, you can sometimes find information. For Korea, oops, sorry. Um, we are also making use of Oh, you know what? Sorry, I'm now was reading the Korea one. You can see I'm jet lagged. Sorry. So we we are we for China there is one. But there is also the same gain report for Korea. And under the section pesticides and contaminants, this was published in 2018. Um, you can see that M MFDS is responsible for the regulation of MRLs. And as of December 2017, MFDS has set MRLs for 466 pesticides in agricultural products. The food code also lists others. And in addition to the food code, MFDS has set up an MRL database for agricultural products with English subtitles. So what's valuable out of this one is it give, it's giving you a bit of a process of how they're working. And in this particular slide, it says that there's, there's almost a, a deferral, deferral process. <coughs> If an MRL is established in the food code for a pesticide on a particular agricultural product, other tolerance levels such as codex are not accepted. However, for pesticides where tolerance levels have not been established in the Korean food code, rules described below are applicable. The first one is the codex standard set for a particular agricultural product in question shall apply. The second one, if the provision in one is not applicable, the lowest residue lo limit for the pesticide in question for a similar agricultural product shall apply. And thirdly, if provisions in one and two are not applicable, the lowest of the residue limits of the pesticide for any agricultural crop shall apply. So all I'm saying is that you can get information from this that can guide you on how to apply the rules. 
This is the food code, so, which was available since 2017, the updated one. But in the case of the Korean one, there is actually more information. It's not like the Chinese one. You can actually look in that code and you can see the English. Okay? There was also a WTO notification for Korea in July 2018. So just like the EU, if you go on the WTO you can uh, notifications, you can pick up if there changes. And that particular notification highlighted that there were proposed amendments in the standards for food. Now, in our case, we looked at it. We haven't yet got access for any of our products. Table Grapes is still trying to get access. But we looked at it. None of our products were changing. So the way that works is here's the standard. If they amend, it gets added on. It doesn't mean if there's nothing in there, you can't use it. So there were amendments. I think it was on berries and something. But I'm just trying to highlight that using the WTO process, you can pick up if there are changes. Um, this was documents that came out of that. Again, if you look at the first one, it's in Korean. We had to wait until there was an English translation. But there is also a very effective website where you can look at the regulations. And this is an example of uh, looking at the food lemon. You can select either food or you can look at the active. And it gives you the, the MRL. And this is an ex uh, example, oh, sorry. No, this is so that's Korea. So you c there's good information available to get the MRLs. Japan, Japan has also got a very effective website where they've got the agricultural chemicals and, and food types option, which you can read from. This came in place when they started using the positive list. So here again is an example, if you search for oranges, and there's certain actives there, 2, 4, D, et cetera, et cetera. And this is for lemon. And I just wanted to highlight this because um, the way that uh, Japan works, since they had a positive, the, they moved to the positive list, uh, which was somewhere in 2003, Japan expects foreign countries to make requests for establishing or revising MRLs for agricultural chemicals when the levels they have are low. So you can actually go through a process and request import tolerances. And I just took this extract because I actually received it on the 1st of November. It's an email from our government party from the um, attache that's in Tokyo that was just highlighting us for us useful information and the process if you want to do, if you want to submit the request for import tolerances. And as I say, you can actually go on the website and do that. So actually they have quite good information. And this just to highlight that I've said all along, one of the resources we obviously make use of is ongoing review of the WTO notifications. Because we can then see if there's MRL changes coming, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I wanted to share with you this is a, a database of information in South Africa, Agri Intel, which does require that you register. And maybe not all the actives you use are on there because it, it is, you can check for registered products in South Africa. Um, but I actually have a copy in front of me here. And this is my colleague, 
that's involved also, that has a lot of engagement with the markets in the UK. So it's a resource where if you go onto it, you can't see it's very small, but I, down the side here, it lists the market requirements. So Lidl, the one that won't let you use a non-approved product, the last column gives you that information. And the color coding, which is stipulated in the document, gives you an indication of what the markets will or won't accept. So it's quite a helpful tool from that point of view. But also here on the left, if they pick up that the e there's a proposed EU MRL, because this is citrus, you can actually you get in there and you can see the information. So it might be a resource you could look at. So just out of interest, quite clever query. There's a proposed MRL in the EU, which will go from 0 0.1 to 0 0.01. Lindy, it's just now talking about uh, Maxim, you know, in the field, or uh, uh, Topper in plant. So, so it's, a, oh, sorry, it's a good resource. It also indicates the Japanese and the Korean information. And if there's a WTO that's proposing an MRL. So Abermectin in Japan, there is an, it, it, an MRL is going to go up from 0 0.01 to 0 0.1. Um, just as an example of one or two others. EU again, Rupufazin is again an MRL proposed from 1 to 0 0.01. So you can see those are products that are obviously got cutoff criteria. Um, so you could either go on the website and look on there or register, you need to register someone wants to have a look, I can point it out to them when, when the light is better. <laughs> I can't see it so well now. So I just wanted to end off by going back to the pro citrus list. Now when you provided me the list, it only had the active. But when you're looking at this sort of thing, you've got to know, yeah, sorry, you, that only had the the trade name, you, know, you need to know the active. So I went and added all the active. Now, we touched on some of them, but just to give you a feeling, this is one of the ones that I found now in the fresh roll, which is on Panazequin, one of your products. The draft regulation, not yet published, they still have to take a vote, but I think they've already taken that at the most recent October meeting. But you see, it's not always bad news, because now that one is not going down for you. Staying at 0.5. You do sometimes find that, that a regulation's published, and you'll see that there wasn't a change for your particular product. And it's also the same for Acetamiprid. There's a, a current and a new, it's a draft regulation, but it looks like it's not going to affect you, citrus. And then just to give you uh, more information, you can also Google EU standing committee meetings. This was the one from September. And there's a lot of information in there. You can, you can look at a summary report. Sometimes they don't come out immediately. But if you look at, for instance, in Mazalol, for the meeting that, that was held in September, 
This would be the, up, the most up-to-date inf date information. It says, the Commission informed the committee that in July 2018 it received a request for administrative review according to Article Referring to a recently published reasoned opinion on Imazalil under Article 10 of Regulation EC, which identified toxicological concerns for metabolites. So that's going to be under discussion going forward. And then for glyphosate, furthermore, it says the Commission recalled that due to the horizontal nature of Concerned, so there's different thing, processes happening there, but you can get a feeling for what's happening on the active. Glyphosate, at the same meeting, the Commission outlined envisaged approach to take uh, the EFSA review of the existing MRLs for glyphosate according to Article 12, so that's a review of, of uh, process of MRLs, of the regulation. Um, into account for amending the existing MRLs, and several member states took the floor to express their views in some cases preliminary on the, uh, on the approach. So it depends sometimes how political the member states are. We know sometimes Spain makes problems for us. But there you can see it's under discussion. And just this was stuff I took this morning out of the newsletter. So the, the following the meeting, um, which was now recently held, the Commission now published three draft regulations, Benaziquin, which is the one I showed you, Acetamaprid, is the pending publication, and then there's then butyrosine oxide, fibrobin, and buprosin are draft regulations still pending discussion. So you can see there's something coming up for some of your products. So if you go to that website that I told you on the EU, once that decision is taken and voted, you'll find the regulation there. So you can see there are, and if I go and look at them, some of those would probably be the ones that are around up for approval, 2019. So those are ones that are coming your way. Okay, so I want to use some slides just to sum up my colleague that is involved in this. He works closely with Citrus as well. I took some of the table grape slides out because I didn't realize there were table grape producers here. But um, if we talk now around, this is now EU focus. Compounds, uh, the following compound types are becoming difficult or impossible to defend. Neurotoxins, such as organophosphates, COPs, compounds with negative effect on ecological food chain, chlorinated carbohydrates, endocrine disruptors, carcinogens implicated in the development of cancers, mutagenic compounds implicated in the development of fetal abnormalities. So you can see if it's those type of things, we don't usually comment because we don't have the data in South Africa to support it. So we need to make a plan then, what else can we use? Also, it's important to look at the persistency of compounds in the environment. In the past, these risk factors were known but mitigated by limiting the exposure. But under the hazard-based cutoff criteria, mitigation is still critical, and the product cannot become eligible for re-registration or reauthorization, as I've been saying to you. And then to bring it down to the retailer intervention or private standards or non-regulatory requirements, the different terms used out there. The compound might be safe and legal to use on export fruit, but when used close to harvest, residues could be detected. This can be problematic and might restrict the use of other compounds by some retailers. Restricts the number of detected residues. 
and some of them do not tolerate residues which exceed a certain percentage of the MRL or the ARFD. For example, not more than a third of the, e, uh, of the EU MRL and the ARFD per compound. They do not tolerate residues of compounds which are not EU approved, like Lidl, some of them. Some compounds are safe and legal, but very persistent. And even if they are used months before harvest, trace residues, which are greater than 0 0.01, might still be detected. And some retailers regard traces as residues. This limits the, the deployment of other much needed products later in the season if conditions demand attention. So if we look at the UK, we, this is just a tab, tabular way of looking at it. The retailers ex excluding Lidl and the EU retailers, 100% EU MRL, because Lidl is also found in the UK, that's why it's put like that. So looking at it, that 100% of the EU MRL, except if stated otherwise, in the EU retailers, some of them are less than 100% of the EU MRL. In the UK, there's no percentage ARFD restriction. But especially in Germany, they restrict the percentage of ARFD, 100% or less than 100%. In the UK, there's no restrictions on the sum of the total of the percentage MRL or ARFD, and in the EU, some restrict the number and, and the sum of the total of the percentage of MRL. Very complex. Um, so, so it goes on. Um, some of them uh, talk to the PPL list, some have a black list, and that's why the information that I guided you to on the Agri-Intel is very helpful because it will be able to tell you some of those things. So if you look at the German market, they also vary. Is it 70% of the EU MRL, 80%? Some of them will say they want a maximum of five actives. Some will say three to five actives, depending. And that's a problem if you get a surprise like a phosphonate you didn't know about. This is an example of an ARFD calculation for Lidl. I won't go into the detail here, but if you look at the MRL and you look at the residue of a third of the EU MRL, the green column, and you look at the proposed ARFD, then you can see how some of them exceed it. That's the approach they take. So I'm, I'm just scanning these ones. So this is just the risk actives that from Corvus' perspective, um, and some of the things, although Cetimipid now we've just said it's actually being, the MRL seems to be okay, but he's maybe been watching the space. The Fossetal, we know there's the acute reference dose thing. So these are just some of them that he's pointed out in case thylacostrobin is not registered in South Africa. I think we've got about one or two more slides on this. Bueno, pasamos a una ronda de preguntas. Si hubiera alguna... ¿Algún comentario o duda al respecto, por favor? Enzo, Emilia. Eh. Eh, bueno, en Sudáfrica eh, esa la presentación de la información se da a través de ustedes. Acá en el Perú, ¿cómo se podría hacer? ¿Quién nos representaría? ¿Cómo se podría presentar esta información para sustentar eh, eh, la continuidad de ciertos químicos para que den ampliaciones o cosas así. Um, are you talking about the official regulations? 
No, he's asking about the possibility. Who is going to present the information here in Peru? Maybe I can uh, just answer. Maybe an association, an or a national organism. So, as I said, um, we have presented when information where we had scientific data on the DPA, diphenylamine. Um, we, we were able to work through fresh farm because we are SHAFE members. And Pro Citrus is also a SHAFE member. So if it's an active that fresh fall is, um, is following, monitoring, and you have data, like recently they were wanting to know what the impact was for pro chloras. We use it, but dormant application. Whereas in, the, in South Africa, the citrus industry do use it, and so do the subtrop industry. And so they made comments to Freshfile so that it could be part of a consolidated comment. Quizás lo que Ernesto nos quería comentar es que actualmente la información de ingredientes activos está muy dispersa en el Perú. Entonces, eh, sí necesitamos ordenarnos para poder compilar la información. Sabemos que CPF como comprador corporativo maneja esta información para sus asociados, pero actualmente nosotros hacemos esta revisión de forma individual, cada empresa, si tengo entendido. Entonces, eh, sería una buena oportunidad para poder compartir la información y es de lo que hablaron eh, mucho en el último congreso del Global Gap. Redes de conexión, confianza y, eh, eh, confianza y seguridad. ¿no? O sea, un poco confianza y transparencia. ¿sí? Es, son dos variables que están relacionadas una con otra eh, para poder tener mayor información a, al respecto. La información está en realidad en todo el mundo, pero... Eh, vale la pena eh, tomarse el tiempo de poder compartirla y sistematizarla para entender a los mercados y poder llegar a ellos de forma adecuada. Remember from a market access point of view, if Peruvian citrus, as an example, has a problem in the EU, it has an impact of all of you. So in South Africa, as much as I would give this up tomorrow, because I think our industry takes it for granted, they, they just get it, the information on the table. They don't realize what goes into it. Um, but our industry we work as an industry unit to consolidate this information. Um, so in South Africa, the citrus industry does the same for the citrus industry, CGA, Citrus Growers Association. We, Port Grow, do it for the deciduous fruit industry. And the subtrop industry does it for the subtrop. So it's definitely one, I did ask Sergio, I wasn't sure if there was MRL information available because I couldn't even know what level you work at. So for instance, when we were talking earlier about the EU MRL going down, as an example, when the problem was happening with Chlorpyrifos. The EU parties were also worried because they were using it at 0 0.5 ppm. But in South Africa, we apply it as a dormant application. So the MRL is 0 0.05. So when the MRL went down, it was no problem for us. But if you don't have that information for yourselves, it's, it makes it more difficult to try and watch the space. Okay. 
¿Otra pregunta? Sí, eh, Claudio. Um, hello, my name is Claudio Barragán from CPF, is an exporter of fresh fruits. Um, I'm very uh, I'm interested to know your, uh, what is your opinion about the, the, um, the limits that some uh, retailers in Europe demand uh, about uh, working under the LMRLs or some percentage of the area FD, okay? Um, is this, uh, at the moment, uh, this situation is a big problem for the, Houston, uh, the industry in the South Africa? It's a bad echo, so I'm not hearing it very well. So maybe if you can repeat. Yeah. Um, I heard that, in, is it a problem in South Africa? Yeah. You know that some retailers in Europe demand uh, work under the limits of LMRL. Which okay. Is what, yeah, okay. What is your opinion about that? Sorry. And this situation in South Africa is a big problem for the South African industry in fresh fruit uh, market? It's the biggest problem. It, if you hear me, usually, at the Global Gap Conference, in fact, you didn't see my comments. I sit on the Global Gap Technical Committee, and they were talking. They are talking about wanting to have a voluntary residue monitoring system. And as a producer representative on the te technical crops, I'm always very aware of the fact that when they make demands, I'm not saying Global Gap is, but the retailers, when they think they are making demands for the better, you can't practice IPM because you're having to work below, you have resistance issues. So from a, from a grower perspective, most of the requirements they are doing are, are not even scientifically justified. Yes, I know that one of the reasons that came out in one of the breakout sessions on uh, zero risk, uh, one of the reasons parties do it is because of the NGO pressure, the Greenpeace pressure, et cetera. So certainly, wherever we can, as an industry, lobby against the requirements we do. Because we don't believe growers can uh, follow IPM practices by some of the, the imposed requirements from the private standards. So it is a problem. It's probably one of the most, in fact, uh, this next slide also says that. What is the impact? by all of these private standard requirements. Um, a lot of parties start looking at the, the biorationals or the biologicals, which is what we also in our industry, I've got some slides now I can show you that we've got quite a lot of research over the last few years that we've been doing to look at alternatives to move away. New chemicals with short withholding periods are the requirement, but often you find that the beta, the, even thiocloprid was one of the actives that supposedly had a higher MRL than, as, as in phosmethyl, we could use at 0.05, but thiocloprid was 0.3, but now look, thiocloprid is under the hammer. So these things are changing. Um, so it impacts on the pre-harvest interval, it impacts on all of these issues. So we certainly, from an industry point of view, do not support it. Um, so, but we, are, we have to be aware of it, and from a perspective of Corbus Hartmann, who engages quite closely with some of these parties, um, one tries to, from a scientific point of view, convey to them that what they're doing is not always correct and what impact it has on sustainability of the chemicals, which is a point I made at the breakout session on Monday at the pre-conference. It depends which end of the stick is wielding what, if you can be sustainable or not. And so most of these requirements don't allow producers to be able to be sustainable, follow IPM, have resistance issues, etc. But they still impose them.
¿Otra pregunta? Ernesto. Sí, se nos ha dado información de lo que es, dónde conseguir información de los MRLs, ¿no? de los máximos niveles de residuos. Eh, pero, ¿de dónde se consigue la información de los ARFDs? Y si esto también es, eh, varía entre lo que es la Unión Europea con respecto a otros. Some of that information is available um, on the EU website. The, some of those columns actually gave you the ARFD, the acute reference dose. And yes, to answer you, because the formula they use can differ, you can have sometimes a problem like in Netherlands, because they're applying, so it can vary. But they are trying to work on that issue. As a, they, I think it's at a JMPR level, codex, under codex. They're trying to find a way forward, but it won't happen overnight. But yes, you can get some of that information on the EU website. One of the slides I showed you, under the active ingredient, it actually lists all of that information. So you can get that information. And also on this website, you can also get information about the ARFD, because the markets apply it. Alfredo? Our information, just out of interest, is focused on the regulatory MRLs. Otherwise, and, but the, the fact is from my budget initially, oops, we supported the initiation of this database. So don't worry, don't worry. So um, crop in South Africa, crop life, actually pays towards this Agri-Intel database. But you can register and you can get on there. You don't pay, not like homologia. They want our information, but they, they I would have to pay for theirs. <laughs> then just some warnings. The point I made earlier about registrations with double or triple active compounds, because you can see that with the way things are going, some of the tools might be affected. Like in South Africa, I know you use filibuster um, the market didn't want imazolol, so filibuster for palm fruit, it never really was working. Because the perimethanol, yes, but not the imazolol. So that's just another word of warning. So, that is my presentation. But I thought you might want to know, our industry, I said to you, has a focus um, on the research side as well. So the, under the crop protection strategy, the, the, we look at, looked at certain short-term integrated control to reduce the residues and set guidelines for growers to move towards sustainable crop protection practices in the medium term to reduce the reliance on chemicals and in the long term, non-chemical sustainable crop protection. And just to see 
how we've been doing. So what, what has been driving some of that is the demand for all of these issues. So that is why we started looking at, at a strategy to reduce um, and minimize the use of chemicals. And we have a concept called the orchard of the future. And these are just some of the aspects that are considered, and especially under, under this one, no synthetic chemical inputs. You can see these are some of the ones that we have looked at. Um, obviously, mating disruption, sterile insect techniques, <coughs> using the wasps, wide area control, and especially some of the work on the intermepathogenic nematodes, the EPNs. And I don't expect you to read this at all, but on the 18th, uh, 20th of September, uh, the industry started a new process uh, where all the research we've been doing under the crop protection strategy, looking at the phytosanitary, so our research on phytosanitary has been increasing because of the problems we've had with the EU. And uh, looking at nematology, IPM, soil health. And these are some of the projects um, on the, bio, the biological, biorational. The control of woolly apple aphid using entomopathogenic fungi or EPNs, as we call them, using biological control, like fungi and nematodes, like the metarhysiums, uh, against uh, sporadic pests in vineyards and orchards, incorporating uh, EPNs and the fungi into integrated IPM systems to control codling moth, EPNs from local agricultural soils to control banded fruit weevil, uh, which is Flectinus callosus. It's one of our, it's a snout beetle. It's a, it's a problem for some of our markets. Uh, the exploration of orchard sanitation and potential of wasp for biological control of fruit flies, integrated management of the control of false codling moth, Thamnatica leucotrica, um, and, and investigating biological control agents for the management of cap Mediterranean fruit fly. So that's just to show you that we also, as an industry, trying to look at alternatives. And one final slide. I said to you that I've been 20 years next year in my job. And I think the new market access and the chemicals were always a challenge. But I think over the last few years, maintenance of your markets is becoming the increasing challenge. So just this past season, um, we, we have had problems or challenges where we've had to invest in research and, and actions for our exports for peach and nectarines to the EU. We had to work on a systems approach, which means now from January 2018, it's a phytosanitary market. 
Um, we, we also deemed as uh, comparative trials between Mediterranean fruit fly and Bactacera dorsalis because we, we had one area that was under quarantine that now, now requires a 22-day cold treatment. And most of the work you do, Bactacera dorsalis is less tolerant than Mediterranean fruit fly. So that's why we're investing in doing that. And finally, the, the codling moth, that loss of our Taiwan market was a very critical one for us. And we had to put a self-regulatory system in place. Bueno, eh, ha sido una charla muy nutrida. Eh, le brindamos un aplauso a Lindy, por favor, por su excelente exposición. Eh, nos ha ganado un poco el tiempo actualmente. Eh, quizás algunas de las preguntas podríamos abordarlas eh, luego de, de concluir. Y bien, les agradecemos su asistencia. Emilia, creo que ya estamos con... Sí. Entonces, eh, va a estar disponible la presentación en la página de Procitrus. Eh, y bueno, cualquier otra oportunidad estaremos en contacto con ustedes. Muchas gracias.